Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Audience, uh, today we are speaking with uh, a man who is, uh, I call him the biggest mensch in the multiverse. It is uh, Lord Martin Rees, Astronomer Royale, a friend of the Arthur C. Clarke Center for Human Imagination, uh, longtime influence, inspiration, and really, in some ways, the father of my field of CMB polarization, as I'll explain as we go on. But first today, uh, Martin, welcome. Are you in Cambridge right now? I'm at home in Cambridge, and uh, great to be with you, Brian. It's great to, to be with you. I always cherish our conversations. Today, we're going to be talking uh, first about your book, On the Future, uh, which came out a couple of years ago. But the reason for this is that uh, Lord uh, Reese was one of the recipients of the Arthur C. Clarke Foundation um, Awards recently uh, for the future, along with Ted Chang and Fabi Fabiola Giannetti of CERN. And uh, it's, it was an occasion to get get some time with him i could not resist so first of all congratulations on winning the arthur c clark foundation award thank you very much and that was about the future and i think your book is was really kind of a, a cornerstone theme I, I read it when it came out i reread it and uh and i really do want to talk about it usually uh lord martin we we review the first thing i always say is i judge all books by their cover and this cover is perhaps the most sparse cover I've ever seen. So we won't talk about the cover, but I do want to talk about the title. You are known for provocative titles. And in some cases, your titles get changed depending on where they're printed. So first of all, can you explain what is the meaning of On the Future and the prospects for humanity? What drove you to create a book like this? Um well, as you mentioned, I did have a book uh, about 15 years ago, which I called uh, Our Final Century, with a question mark, <laughs> which uh, raised issues about long-term threats. The publishers cut out the question mark, but when it was uh, published in America, the title was changed to Our Final Hour. And I interpret that as being that you guys want instant gratification and a reverse. <laughs> and That's right. Um, Instant anyway, annihilation. That was the title. And this was a more innocuous uh, title. But uh, the theme of the book uh, is that um, uh, we are in a very special century. And I guess that's what we'll be discussing. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> before we begin, I do want to mention uh, this um, honorific that you maintain, which is uh, Astronomer Royal. And, and you once told me, and in fact, you, you say it in the book, but I'm going to tell it the way you told me, that most of the time people think your job is to read the Queen her horoscope. Yes. <laughs> and and I, I love that line. And I'm hoping you'll tell me what I am. Uh, but, I, but, I, <laughs> but I once went to a, a horoscope reader when I was dating my uh, soon-to-be wife of uh, mm. 14 or so years from now. I, sh I should remember that. Uh, but we were dating and she wanted to to see some, you know, astrologer. And the astrologer asked me, what's your sign? And I said, well, you know, I'm a Gemini, I think. And she said, okay, well, this is going to happen to you. There's going to be, you know, fluctuations in the stock market. Um, there'll be uncertainty in the Middle East. And, uh, and then at the end, I said, you know what, I'm actually born in September. Isn't that a Virgo? And the astrologer said, yeah, but it doesn't matter. Your horoscope's the same. <laughs> And I wonder, you talk a little bit about in the book, for the first time, I feel like we're, I have a kindred spirit in that you're kind of a um, little, not antagonistic towards Karl Popper, but the notion of the demarcation hypothesis and how that has become synonymous with what is good science. I wonder, mm -hmm. could you speak a little about your views on Popperism? I talked to Lenny Susskind about a month ago, and he called it the paparazzi, and don't get obsessed with the paparazzi. Tell me, what are, you, what are your feelings about what constitutes science in the context of astrology, astronomy, et cetera? Well, I mean, I think it's got to be something which uh, is subject to empirical test and which is uh, progressive, et cetera, and astrology isn't because it's uh, mumbo jumbo and you can't really test it and it hasn't survived the test have been done. Um, but um, uh, the popper um, uh, scenario, which of course has been very popular, I mean, most philosophers are unduly contemptuous of, sorry, most scientists are unduly contemptuous of philosophy. Hawking in particular was outrageously dismissive of philosophy, completely unjustifiably. Um, but um, the philosophers who scientists have liked include uh, two, I guess, in particular, um, and one of them is Karl Popper. And his uh, 
idea was that to be a scientific statement, it's got to be refutable. If you can't refute it, then it's not science. And there's something in that, because uh, um, uh, to take uh, an example, I mean, um, uh, reincarnation, which is an idea held by many people, but uh, uh, there's no way in which you could refute it to their satisfaction. So that's the reason why reincarnation is not science. Um, but uh, refutation is, of course, an important part of science. But it's not infallible. I mean, I quote an example in my book um, that um, supposing that the Michelson-Morley experiment, that's the experiment which shows that uh, light goes at the same speed um, at any time in the year, even though the Earth is going around. Um, if that had been done in the um, 16th or 17th century, it would have been used to refute Copernicus. People would say that uh, clearly so the Earth does not move. Um, and so that is an example showing how uh, you can't be convinced of a refutation unless you're convinced of the um, uh, grounding of that particular argument. So uh, it's fuzzier than Popper tried to maintain. But nonetheless, uh, he pointed out that if you can't find any evidence against a theory, and uh, reincarnation is an example of that, uh, then it's not really science. Yes, I want to run by you an example, another example, uh, and get your impressions about it. And that is um, the proof that the Earth is not round from the reddening of sunlight at sunset, or equivalently in the cosmic microwave background uh, image, or, or the observatory that's behind me in my Zoom background, yes, yes. The, the very thick optical density of the atmosphere, which is indicative of a flat, planar atmosphere, which means that the Earth must be a flat, yeah. planar yeah. object. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yes, and I think, um, and I wanted to ask you this for a while, I've asked it of Sir Roger Penrose um, and, uh, and, and others, and that is about, you know, falsification um, yes. and, 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 and Popper that I have noted sort of a, an envy, you know, Freud would probably call it a math, mathematician envy uh, as, as, as his want. And it's ironic that Popper wasn't talking about cosmology or astronomy. He was actually a proponent of the steady state, as you know, for, for some time. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but he was, he was uh, irritated at astrologers and even psychoanalysis as you talk, talk about in on the future. But um but the but the impression that I get is that we physicists are um, antagonized, or perhaps uh, we are envious of mathematicians because Gödel showed what constitutes mathematics. But there's no equivalent for what constitutes physics, and and I wonder is that because physics is by nature provisional and yeah, and it is subject to imperial update. I mean, Isaac Asimov once said, you know, the, if you think the Earth is flat, you're wrong. If you think the Earth is a perfect sphere, you're also wrong, but you're less wrong than if you think it's flat. <laughs> so I wonder, do we feel as physicists inadequate, envious, uh, perhaps tension and anxiety because we can't refute things so easily as, say, Gödel showed in mathematics? Um, well, that may be true, but of course, uh, you're asking the obverse of the most common question, which is physics envy, yes. which many other scientists have, because right. compared to most other sciences, which deal with things more complicated than the single atoms and molecules and uh, um, Newtonian gravity, uh, physics is simple and straightforward. Yes. And uh, therefore, it is easier to get clear-cut results in physics than in most other sciences. Mm -hmm. sub subject matter of physics is simpler. So normally people say that uh, uh, it's the other subjects that are. And of course, um, the way in which you can gain confidence in a science, even when it's not one that lends itself to clear cut refutations, is if a whole set of arguments embeds together in a consistent story. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think if you look at something like a um, continental drift, for instance, um, the, the, um, tectonics, that was an idea, um, is, and what was convincing about that was it explained lots of hitherto surprising and disconnected facts, they all work together. Yeah. And uh, Darwinian evolution is another case. There's, there's a, uh, um, you, you could refute it, I suppose, if you found some um, human bones on the, in the lower stratum than dinosaur bones or something like that, so you could refute it, but um, most people uh, would say that the strength of Darwinism is the huge volume of data which it links together in a consistent way and offers a framework for interpreting. So uh, I think science is a search for 
patterns in unification in diverse data. Mm. And uh, yeah, that reminds me, I, I sometimes joke that my house is so old that uh, there's a nuclear reactor and it's covered up by some dinosaur bones. And, and that <laughs> just blows people's minds. But um, speaking of Girdle, uh, allegedly he believed until his deathbed, according to some young person who emails me all the time about the rotating universe hypothesis, that the universe uh, is rotating in at least Girdle's conception of the cosmo cosmogony. And, and then even on his deathbed, he said that he wondered, is the universe still rotating? <laughs> and and yes. you must get a lot of these emails. I get a lot of them. I was joking with um, with Adam Reese, uh, who uh, was on the podcast a couple of times this year. And uh, I said, you know, Adam, I get all these emails, you know, as I'm sure you do. Einstein was wrong. I can prove it if you help me with the maths, because I'm not so good at maths. Uh, but if you help me, I'll share a portion of the Nobel Prize with you. I get those emails. And Adam said, yeah, how do you think I got my Nobel Prize? Uh, <laughs> yeah. So uh, what do you make of the fact that there's so many people that are so interested in proving you know, Stephen Hawking, right or wrong, or proving Einstein. Uh, but no one really comes up and says, I think Boltzmann was wrong, and or Maxwell was wrong. I mean, Maxwell was actually wrong about many things, but um, but nobody seems, they always seem to want to take down Einstein. What is that compulsion that people have in, in your... Well, I, mean, I think, you know, they want to attack the biggest targets, don't they? And uh, Einstein is one, but uh, Darwin's one. And But I also have had uh, letters from people saying Newton was wrong. Hmm. That's a good because I was a uh, head of Newton's College and uh, president of the side where he did. <laughs> I agree. Did. So there's people who are slightly more original who want to go back and prove Newton wrong, not <laughs> merely to show Einstein was wrong. But of course, showing Darwin was wrong is, of course, a much more popular pursuit. Yes. Yes, of course. And, uh, you know, of course, Newton was wrong uh, in some ways, but uh, he, he hasn't retracted his uh, some of his blunders in alchemy and in uh, theology. And I guess that brings me to another point. I often find that um, the most famous scientist on Earth right now, to the extent that anybody knows a scientist, um, they might think that Stephen Hawking and Hawkins, that I usually say, I want to write to you about Stephen Hawkins. And I say, well, first you have to spell his name right. Mm -hmm. uh, but <laughs> or the Nobel Prize with an L-E at the end. Uh, but I want to know, um, you know, when people think about um, theories or, the or or scientists, rather, they think about theorists. They think about Brian Green. They think about Michio Kaku, Stephen Hawking. Uh, they might think about you. Um, why is it that there's such an overappreciation, in my opinion, an overabundance of, of kind of association with scientists as being theorists, such as yourself? Um, well, I, I suppose they, they like to think of the idea of the, the great mind understanding the universe, etc. But of course, it is um, uh, a very misleading view of science because, I mean, uh, um, if you look at our science, um, then it's owed at least 95% to advances in instrumentation, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, uh, um, we're no wiser than Aristotle was. In fact, we're less wise than he was. And the only reason we made progress is by having better data, really. And, uh, uh, and so it's, an, it's a subject which is led by observation, and the observations only improve because of uh, better um, instruments and now better comp computations as well. Uh, so um, the, the armchair theorist, um, of course, gets exaggerated a claim because uh, there are very few um, grants of science where he or she makes a role comparable to that of the experimenter. And I'm curious, you said that we are less wise than Aristotle. I, I feel like I don't know something that Aristotle said uh, from heavy bodies fall faster than light bodies to, you know, notions about the st steadiness of the universe's endurance. Um, I don't know a single physical principle that he was right about. Uh, he was brilliant. When it came to philosophy and, and social psychology. No, 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 but I'm saying that uh, um, he, was, he, wasn't, he wasn't right, but as an intellect of range, um, he was clearly very high IQ indeed. Yes. Um, Probably higher than us. <laughs> <laughs> and that brings me to another question. Tomorrow night, uh, I'll be speaking with Jayant Narlikar, who is uh, a, one, a wonderful figure. And I'm sure, uh, uh, did you overlap with Jayant and Fred Hoyle? Um, he was about three or four years ahead of me. But uh, of course, I, uh, I I did overlap with him. He was uh, working with Fred Hoyle um, uh, 
as a postdoc when I was a graduate student. And of course, I've seen him ever since. And in fact, I, um, I, I did um, a, a Zoom uh, a public lecture to Yuka in Pune, which he set up just a month ago. Oh, wonderful. Oh, well, I'll send you his, uh, his send him your regards and vice versa after I talk to him. But I'm curious, he still maintains in aspects of the steady state theory, the quasi steady state theory's veracity. And it brings me to my next question that, you know, I've seen a lot of times and, you know, from being one of my most prominent endorsers of my book, Losing the Nobel Prize, that, you know, we've had to retract many experimental results that achieve great, great notoriety variety and great public attention. I always joke that the announcement occurs on, you know, above the fold uh, on page one of the New York Times or, or the San Diego Union Tribune here. And uh, but then the retraction, if it's ever published, occurs, mm, you know, on the page 17B of the Saturday morning edition that nobody reads. Um, and so I've seen a lot of experiments retracted. I have yet to see a theory retracted, you know, just fully divorced. Even Jeff Burbage, who I have the honor of having his office here at UC San Diego, you know him very well, and he was um, and he was he was the holder of my office before I moved in after his uh, death in 2010. But um, but he went to his grave believing in the in the veracity of the steady state theory too. So what what is it about theories that become so? Um, so endeared, you know, to their to their conjecturers that, and you you've had many of these instances of creating theories. So first, what is it about a theory that holds such permanence in the heart of his or her of its creator? Well, I mean, uh, I think what you're saying is one category of person is is like that, um, and uh, and they they do get uh, obsessed with, with the uh, theory, and indeed an experimenter who spent ten years building an instrument. Um, is going to uh, probably have an exaggerated feeling for the importance of what it will discover. Otherwise, it wouldn't be motivated. So it's not surprising that people get committed to a theory. And of course, as Max Planck famously said, that uh, um, theories survive until all their proponents die off. Right. And that's certainly true of some of them. Um, but people do change. But it, it is very interesting because, um, uh, uh, if I could mention someone else, my, my PhD advisor was Dennis Sharma. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, he was uh, someone who, um, uh, he, he was the um, most prominent believer in the steady state theory, apart from its three inventors. His Bondi Golden Hall invented it, and he was a great supporter of it. When I started in 1964 as a graduate student, he was a believer in the steady state theory. Yes. Um, and uh, I think I helped to talk him out of it because <laughs> one of my student papers was with him, uh, which was some of the new evidence against steady state. Um, but he was someone who had to believe something strongly in order to be motivated to work on it. Uh, he was like a lawyer, and uh, he would have this thing, so uh, what do we say if they find that, you know, and et cetera. So he had to be com committed. Uh, but uh, if I look at my own attitude, I think I'm genuinely not like that at all. Hmm. I'm quite happy to work at the same time on two contradictory theories, hmm. on the grounds that I want to know the answer. And by running the two horses against each other and seeing if one stumbles, then that's the way to decide which is the best. So um, uh, I'm very happy because I want to know the answer um, to explore two theories. That's enough motivation for me to know the answer. Whereas there are some people, and Dennis Sharma's example, had to believe that something was almost certainly correct in order to follow up its consequences. And as you say, th those who've got a great commitment to a, th a theory um, are um, going to be uh, those who are reluctant to give it up. And if we go back to Nalikar, he was a student of Fred Hoyle, and uh, Fred Hoyle actually, um, he, he, he was such an inventive man. He had lots of theories, and he didn't really have all that much stake in any one of them, I don't think. So um, he, he, he enjoyed the debate. And there was another debate going on um, at this time, which was the first evidence against steady state, which came before the microwave background um, from the um, distribution um, of the um, uh, radio sources, radio. Uh, no, quasars, and um, Martin Ryle, who was a radio, a radio astronomer, um, built an interferometer, and he showed evidence that there were more of these exploding galaxies, as well, which now called quasars, um, far away than there are nearby, implying that there were more in the past. 
than there are now. Um, and uh, this would be inconsistent with steady state because at all times the universe should look the same, whereas it is consistent with the evolving universe. And um, uh, th there was a long debate between uh, Hoyle and Ryle, which got a lot of public interest in the UK. Um, but it was interesting because um, Hoyle was someone who enjoyed debate and, to, it, uh, um, and he didn't get upset by it, whereas Ryle got really, really upset. <laughs> if his work was criticised. And to be fair, he was right. Yeah. Um, but the point was that he'd actually built this, the world's first um, interferometer uh, using apocynthesis techniques, and he'd built the thing himself and worked for years and years. And so he got a huge investment in this project. So it's not surprising that he was uh, um, going to be rather committed to its results and uh, to have them sort of... Uh, disparaged by an armchair theorist was upsetting for him. Yeah, and of course, he uh, in some ways had a, a later laugh, although maybe not the last laugh with uh, the recipient of the Nobel Prize. And was he the Astronomer Royal? I forgot. Um, um, he, he he was for a time because uh, the history of that job is that until 1960, it was the person who ran the Greenwich Observatory. Yes. Um, uh, which was a real job. But then when, when uh, that became a museum, um, and people started going to Hawaii and Chile to do observations. They kept the title, but kept it as an honorary title. Mm. And uh, indeed, uh, uh, Martin uh, Ryle was a holder right. of that title. Yeah, that I believe Margaret Burbage, my late colleague here at UC San Diego, was she was director of RGO, the Royal Greenwich yeah. Observatory, but she wasn't astronomer. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then that caused her, in some ways, beneficially for me to come to San Diego eventually and start my department. Yeah. So yeah. thank the uh, thank the uh, astronomer royal uh, recipients or deciders for that for me, if you will. Um, so just one last thing about you know these these. These theories. I wonder, just speculating, you know, when I build an experiment, it's not me building the experiment. We literally have 300 people working on the Simons Observatory and pictured behind me, whereas a theory can be done by one or two people. Yes, and yes. so it's much more associated with one's identity, I would say. I mean, I bleed and I sweat and I cry over all my experiments, but, you know, if it's a, it has to be a collaborative endeavor. It's too big to be done individually. Whereas I think you can still do theory today. And I want to uh, circle back. In a, in a 2018 interview, you said one of your um, character traits, which I take as a good trait, is, is that you're impatient and you like to multitask in the sense that yeah. you like to work on many different things at once. Uh, mm -hmm. And in some sense, you remind me of uh, Jim Simons in that you like to hedge your, hedge your risk, your downside risk. And of course, that's a lot of what this book on the future is about. We'll get to that in just a second. It's a little hard yeah. to see. Uh, but, um, but getting back to, uh, I want to go back to 1968. Uh, when you came up with the idea that the universe might be, pol the CMB might be polarized. And I want to remind our listeners and viewers that this is only three years after the discovery of the cosmic microwave background itself. And at this point, the anisotropies of the microwave background had not been understood or measured uh, in any way. Even the dipole had not been measured. And here was Lord Reese, as I believe it was part of, was it part of your PhD thesis, Martin? Mm -hmm. As a postdoc. As a postdoc. So you conjecture that it might be polarized if the universe were behaving in an interesting way. And because sometimes I feel like even incorrect theories can provide uh, very important um, touchstones for experimentalists like myself to pursue, even though the ultimately the cause of the polarization in your model was not uh, was not the correct one, in that I believe you ascribed a potential polarization to an anisotropic tropic expansion of the universe uh, expanding as a quadrupole distribution that uh, uh, um, with a quadrupolar asymmetry in its expansion rate i believe technically that that would produce a uh, the conditions necessary for polarization we now know that's not what causes the polarization but nevertheless it wasn't discovered for another 32 years so you spoke once about you know kind of being impatient and then moving on so i want to say is there a value in theories that ultimately might not be right, but they can be used to impel experimentalists like me. Well, I think so. And, uh, just to expand a bit on that, um, the reason I did this was that there was a great deal of interest at that time in anisotropic models where the expansion was fast in, uh, faster in one direction than in a perpendicular direction. And there was something called the mixed master universe, which expanded fast one way and then the other. And the motive for this uh, in the late 60s um, was um, uh, 
provided by uh, Charlie Misner, who's um, a, a theorist at Maryland. And the argument was it was a, it was called a horizon problem that uh, um, different parts of the universe in a standard model uh, don't causally connect early on. And this is uh, um, one of the things that the inflationary idea solved uh, 20 years later. But uh, uh, over in the UK, we were aware of the horizon problem 10, 10 years at least before Alan Guth was. Um, and the arguments being discussed then were that the um, expansion may be anisotropic, and the Russians had ideas like this. And so um, I was familiar with these models for anisotropic universes. And uh, in those models, it's fairly easy to see um, that uh, the radiation will be polarized. Um, uh, and, and then I said at the at the end of my paper that uh, you get this for other kinds of variation, but I was only thinking at that time um, of these uh, uh, models where the entire Hubble expansion was fast in some directions than in others. Yeah, and I wonder, even in the quasi-steady state cosmology, they had this notion of the C field, which, you know, continually created matter uh, so as to preserve the density and the overall appearance, which I remember Jeff Burbage talking to me about was, you know, presaging some notions of the constancy of, of, of dark energy. Uh, yes. I disputed that. I, I do take a little credit uh, because once I gave a talk about our experiment Polar Bear, which is a precursor to the Simons Array, and yeah, yeah. Jeff was in the audience. And usually when a cosmologist would come to speak here at UC San Diego, Jeff would kind of harumph and say, oh, cosmology, really? You know, and his, and his great booming British lion voice. Uh, but this time I showed a picture of our detectors. And he said, and, and I couldn't believe this. He said, wow, that is really cool. And I just thought, you know, he's gone Californian. I mean, it, to, to talk like a surfer. Uh, but yeah. There was something about experiment that he really loved, and 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 of course he he wasn't an observer. He was he was a theorist. Margaret was the observer of the duo, and she was a titanic figure in astronomy. Uh, and you know, as you kind of hinted to before, Planck uh, about uh, you know theories advancing. He said something also, you know, theory or science advances one funeral at a time. Uh, and yet, I still believe there are valuable contributions, even in these things like Narlikar and and so forth. But the the problem is somebody needs to tap them on the shoulder, so to speak, and say, you have this amazing gifted mind, but I think it could be used in other directions. And, and I want to turn to that now. I've yes. done a lot of, oh, sorry, were you going to say something? Well, no, I was going to say, I mean, uh, going back to Nalikar, um, uh, Hoyle uh, was very keen. And uh, the thing is very sad yeah. was that um, uh, Nalikar was a almost complete contemporary of, uh, of Hawking and Carter. Yes. Etc. In the same building, mm -hmm. and uh, Fred Hoyle never appreciated the work which uh, Hawking and Carter were doing, mm. classic work on black holes. Um, and uh, Nalikar had such great loyalty to Fred Hoyle that he never got involved in this. Whereas he was would have been fully able to do uh, important work in uh, the nature of black holes, you know. Yeah. Um, but uh, whereas uh, all the other young people followed the lead of Roger Penrose and uh, used his techniques to explore uh, black holes, and this was all done in the late 60s, um, with the, this group in Cambridge playing a big role. Um, Nalika, I think, out of loyalty to Fred, never got involved. Yeah. And if you look at his later books, he talks about uh, um, cosmology and he talks about the micro background and all that, but he has a chapter at the end where he will uh, feel out of loyalty. He's got to put in a chapter on steady state universe. <laughs> yes, I know. I'm going to talk to him about that very issue uh, tomorrow when he comes on the show. And yes, there are always, you know, there's problems and speculations on cosmology, one of his more recent books. Yeah, and, you yeah. know, some of it, uh, uh, it's, it's curious. It's, 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 um, it's novel to hear, at least from my perspective, that Hoyle was at least maybe less loyal or less passionate, because I always had the impression that he was more embittered than than Narlikar, but it but it sounds like, and I'll talk to, to Giant about this tomorrow, but but the question yeah. of you know whether or not you know the loyalty to a theory and loyalty to an idea, and that takes me to my next question about the proliferation of theories of everything. So I've had a lot of conversations over the last six months with folks like Stephen Wolfram, Eric Weinstein. I'm going to be speaking with, uh, with uh, Julian Barbour, as well as Garrett Lisi and others with new, claim new theories of everything. Yes. As well as, um, you know, people uh, that are in more traditional fields, like I talked to Sheldon Glashow and I've talked to Frank Wilczek about 
this provocative question that I like to pose to my uh, honored guests or my aunt, the guests that honor me. I don't know. <laughs> I do honor you. Uh, but the point is, uh, do we need a theory of everything? And the, the reason harkens back to what you just mentioned about, about Hawking and, and Penrose. And I talk, I asked this of Sir Roger as well. I said, I always find that it's kind of like this Ouroboros, the snake that eats its own tail. We say we need a theory of quantum gravity because we don't understand the properties of singularities at the center of black holes or perhaps a singularity at the origin of time uh, itself in the so-called Big Bang. And the question of, you know, these things must be unified because we need a theory of gravity that's quantized because we can't understand singularities uh, mm -hmm. otherwise. Now, going back to our earlier point about, about um, falsification or maybe even empiricism, we can't ever access the singularity at the core of a black hole. We don't know if it's real. We don't know its entity. We don't know its nature, its properties. It's, it's firewalled off literally. Uh, I mentioned this to Lenny Susskind, uh, and he sort of agreed that the, actually to him, the most interesting part of the black hole is not the singularity, it's the event horizon or what he calls the stretched horizon. And then talking to Sir Roger, similarly about black holes, but also about the origin of the universe, which you know, I'm sure he doesn't believe in a, a quantum, you know, ba bing bang, a singularity in time. And neither does my friend and your friend, uh, Paul Steinhardt. So my, my question is, if God, I know you don't believe, and you don't actively affirm a belief in God, but God hands me a letter, you know, and says, Brian, read this to Lord Martin. And it says, there was no singular Big Bang. It's more complicated than that. It's either classical or eons or, or what have you, or mm -hmm. bouncing. And, yes. um, and, and then they also say, there is no way to observe. God says, you can't observe what's happening at the center of a black hole. So in that case, if you knew there were no real examples that we could ever probe, would you still say we need a theory of everything? Well, I think uh, you're wrong in assuming we could never have any evidence for it, mm -hmm. because um, it's clear, as you say, that uh, we could understand uh, the Big Bang better if we could understand uh, context where clearly gravity is important and quantum theory is important, for things very high density, etc. Um, now, uh, the problem is we can't do experiments um, mm. in those regimes. But we, if we, in principle, had a theory which could describe the conditions right at the beginning of the universe and inside a black hole, and if that same theory predicted the masses of all the elementary particles and the relative strengths and all the fundamental numbers of physics, then we'd know there was something in it. And it's a heresy to think that you have to be able to test all the consequences of the theory. You have to be able to test enough consequences to get confidence in it, and then you take seriously its predictions when you can't observe. So to go back to black holes, we take what Einstein's theory says about the inside of a black hole seriously, even though we can't observe it there, because we've been able to verify Einstein's theory in many other contexts mm. outside the black hole. And so likewise, we could have a theory um, uh, which does give us a deep insight into the Big Bang and unification, and incidentally into dark energy, which I think is going to need a similar sort of theory. Um, and we could gain confidence in it if it manages to explain the standard model and all the arbitrary numbers in that. And if it gives formulae for those, then that would be a huge achievement, and we take the theory seriously. But um, having said all that, um, the, the phrase theory of everything is a very unfortunate phrase, which what we've been talking about now, and what I'm saying we would like to have, is a theory that unifies the four forces of nature, as it were, unifies the gravity for the very large with the very small. And so in Ouroboros, when the snake eats its tail, it uh, can cope with that, uh, that juxtaposition, as it were. That's right. Um, but of course, uh, quantum theory of everything is mis misleading, because if you think of all the other sciences, biology, chemistry, everything else, um, none of them are held up to the slightest extent <laughs> by the lack of this theory. Right. Quantum theory or even nuclear physics is pretty irrelevant uh, <laughs> to, uh, to, to, to chemists and, and biologists. And so the main challenges in science, or some of the main challenges in science, are the challenges of complexity in the biological world. Um, and, uh, uh, and so... Um, even if we accept that everything is a solution to Schrodinger's equation, etc., that's not the way we understand them. 
And I think this sort of um, uh, extreme reductionism is very misleading. Uh, if could, let me give an example of this. Um, of course, lots of people think that uh, living things have special vitalism and all that, you know. And yeah. things and Sir Roger and uh, Stuart Hameroff have this. Uh... Yeah, 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 yes, yes. Um, but the, the main point is that every, every science, uh, when you go from physics to chemistry to cell biology to organisms, um, all the way up to societies, um, each science at each level has its own irreducible concepts. And let me take a simple example. It doesn't involve vitalism. It's less controversial. Um, fluid mechanics. It's a well-defined subject. Okay, the, um, uh, uh, where the concepts are turbulence, viscosity, uh, etc. And you work out and understand how waves break and all that, all that, and when flows go unstable. And it's a serious subject and all that. But the people who work on that subject, they treat the liquid, the water, as a fluid continuum. They don't care it's H2O. <laughs> and even if you had a massive computer which could solve Schrodinger's equation for 10 to the 30th atoms in, 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 in a flowing stream, then that solution wouldn't give you any insight. The insight comes from the level. And so um, uh, as you go one step up from atomic physics, you get things like fluid mechanics, which are scientists of their own right, which have their own concepts. And no one denies that um, uh, a a flow of water is a solution to Schrodinger's equation. (laughs) Um, But it's not helpful to be able to do that, even if you can solve the equation. And of course, um, most of us would say that's true of living things as well. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's a famous quote by, or a phrase attributed to Dirac. You know, he said something like, "You know, my equation explains most of chemistry, and or no, most of uh, all of chemistry, and most of biology." Or so. and I always thought, you know, in, in ninth grade biology class, you know, if I say, "Let me let me get the relativistic Schrodinger equation out and solve it, so I can dissect this frog," yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> some big problems. Well, the frog would have bigger problems. I want to take a quick pause just to just give uh, any insight. What's that? It doesn't give us any insight. That's right. Yes, it's, it's true, but not useful. Uh, I want to give um, a little break to recognize our guest, Lord Martin Rees, author of many books, including Just Six Numbers, On the Future, Our Final Hour slash Century, whichever comes first, I guess. Uh, and I want to thank my uh, listeners and viewers. I want to encourage you to like and subscribe and, and comment on the video. And uh, please leave a review on iTunes or wherever you're listening to this uh, so that we can continue to get great guests like Lord Martin Rees, who I'm just having such a ball with. This is such a a wonderful, delicious treat uh, for me. So, uh, like going back to this this question of of you know w- complexity and things that are complicated, uh, so to speak. I, I always make the distinction like getting a you know a grain, uh, uh, putting a grain of sand on a pile. You know that's complexity, but it's not really complicated. You can describe it in a very short amount of text, and and you go through and hear this Russian gentleman whose name escapes me right now. But he has he has a, a, a rubric or a, a, a way of delineating and calculating complexity as the shortest computer code needed to describe that system. So a system of ten to the you know twenty eighth particles in this giant sand pile is very you know a lot of particles, but they're the underlying forces, as, 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 as you were just saying, uh, Lord Martin, are very simple to understand. And yet we have examples of potential theories of everything. For example, Stephen Wolfram's is very reminiscent of the game of life, which you talk about as being simple in some sense, but you know, having uh, exhibiting complexity, almost reminiscent of life. But I wonder, is maybe, and I asked Stephen about this, and I confess I didn't fully understand his answer, but I said, well, if it's truly a theory of everything, does that mean it's going to get out, um, you know, Bell's inequality? Is it going to get out, you know, EPR? Is it going to get out, um, you know, this uh, collapse of the wave function? Or is it going to unify SU2 with, with SU3 and you want, what is it going to do? And And he said, Yes, I don't understand how something that is like cellular automata, like the game of life, can exhibit the principles that that originate these things. And and I want to take you back to um, to these earlier kinds of, of of suppositions about. 
the multiverse and how the universe could begin. And they always start with the laws of physics. And the question I have is, where do those come from in, in, these, in these models? Is it necessary for a theory of everything to explain, you know, bootstrap how it came about? Or is that asking too much as we don't do a biology, as you said? Um, well, I mean, some people would like to uh, be able to show that our universe is uniquely self-consistent in a way and that the, uh, uh, the, the laws um, uh, constrain it in such a way if we could almost predict the way it is. Some people, I think maybe Roger Penrose, think that's true. But, I mean, I think what Wolfram is doing, it's not conceptually different from what everyone thinks, which is that uh, very, very complex things like animals um, can be produced by simple simple laws. Um, that's all that uh, Conway was doing with his game of life. He pointed that you can't get surprising complexity by um, uh, iterating very simple laws. And that's qualitatively the same as what happens in, in most of chemistry, isn't it? Um, I th whether um, Wolfram's um, theory does incorporate uh, uh, quantum theory completely, I don't know. Um, it may be a different theory. Mm -hmm. So uh, now going through uh, your book, I noted, um, well, first of all, I want to ask you, are you a pessimistic optimist or an optimistic pessimist? Um, well, I mean, I think I would say I'm an optimist about the power of technology, but a pessimist about politics and human nature uh, in that I... Uh, I think the gap between uh, what um, technology would allow us to do and what will actually happen is getting wider and wider. And that's an indictment of our ethics and of our politics. And uh, do you feel that we're, there's any hope for out, out uh, overcoming this? Or as Carl Sagan said, you know, it's dangerous to have a society whose technological capacity exceeds its wisdom and, and how to use that technology. Um, well, it is dangerous, and uh, uh, Carl said that, and uh, um, H.G. Wells said that uh, um, the sense is going to be a, a race between education and catastrophe, and that's that, that's true. Um, so uh, I, I don't know how it will pan out, um, but uh, uh, the world is getting much more difficult to govern, obviously, mm -hmm. um, because it's going connected. I always used to joke, and I, I think I asked this of Sir Roger Penrose the first time I talked to him, but um, if somebody, oh no, I asked this of Freeman Dyson, uh, that's right, and I said, Freeman, if somebody, because he was kind of uh, contrarian, as you know, and I said, uh, you know, if somebody tells you I've got good news and bad news, which do you want to hear first? Mm -hmm. And his answer was kind of uh, surprising, but I want to know first from you, is I don't want to bias the experiment, so if I come up to you and say, Lord Martin, I've got good news and I've got bad news, which do you want to hear first? Yes, mm -hmm. I think I want to hear the bad news first. <laughs> I think he did too. I think he viewed uh, wanting to minimize the number of surprises, but also yeah, yeah. have the extra time to deal with yeah. the consequences of the bad news. Yeah. <laughs> um, what about like uh, uh, somebody says, uh, Lord Martin, we've got this wonderful movie. You got to see it because at the end, you know, they want to spoil it for you. Do you want to know that? Uh, do you want to know the spoil or do you want to have the surprise yourself? Well, if it's a movie, I want the surprise. Okay. But if it's the yeah. stock market, I assume you'd like to know the inside. Right. <laughs> <Yes. laughs> um, so getting back a little bit to, um, to, you know, theory versus experiment, which, you know, is something that we explore a lot on the Into the Impossible That's podcast. Cool. I have this notion that, you know, theory and even theorists are abundant. And uh, whereas experiments are extremely hard to do. And you talk about the LHC in this book, you talk a little bit about the super collider, you know, which was canceled. And I brought this up to Barry Barish. I said, Barry, it was a good thing for you that the super collider was canceled because he was working as one of the leaders of the superconducting super collider. And 1993 was canceled. And uh, it ended up putting him on a path to go to work for on LIGO. Whereas if he had, where he eventually won a uh, third share of the Nobel prize in 2017, and, and yet, if he had stayed with the Super Collider and they had discovered the Higgs, that we know for sure that he wouldn't have won the Nobel Prize because no experimentalist got any share in the Nobel Prize for that yeah. year. So I said, it was good for you. And he said, I don't like to play games like that. And, and we, we moved on to other topics. But I want to ask you when, do you, when do you stop a theory? In other words, 
I know sort of that we lose, uh, we win in experimental physics, such as the cosmic microwave background. We win very slowly with time. Yes. We yes. only win as the square root of time in, in that we have to take four times as much data, four, many, four times as many years to get a 2x improvement on the signal to noise. When do you yes. know when to turn off a theory or turn off an experiment? Is there any kind of rubric that you can help us with to make these decisions? Because they're only getting more and more complex, expensive, and demanding of resources, most of which being the intellect of young people. Yes. Well, I mean, I think in terms of experiments, um, you know, the follow-up to the LHC, LHC, as, HC, as you know, C, as you know, and it's going to be delayed by, I would guess, two decades. We don't know. Um, and that's because people realize that uh, there are other techniques, well, LIGO and underwater neutrino experiments and all these things, which can do exciting science um, in related areas much more cheaply. Um, so, so I think uh, experiments uh, do get more and more expensive, and at some stage you have to jump off and do something else. But of course, theory is very cheap. You just need to, to, to feed someone, and then they can go on um, coming up with, with theories. And I think uh, um, there's a question of whether, um, if you're a theorist, um, do you want to um, work on some popular theory, um, or do you want to strike out and come up with your own theory? And of course, um, I think we're seeing a tendency now um, that uh, more people are coming up with sort of rather more Baroque and exotic theories. Um, mm -hmm. That's because, um, after all, I mean, string theory is 40 years old now, um, and uh, um, you know, it's not clear it's on the right lines or progressing. So there are lots of young people in uh, that sort of field, and they want to do something distinctive and different. Uh, so what happens is you get a, a variety of uh, rather baroque variants of any theory that are going to be developed. And this is just psychology. People want to make their mark, etc. cetera. But uh, um, I, I think it's not very satisfactory if you have a theory and no one else takes it seriously at all. But it's also unhealthy if there's a bandwagon effect and uh, too many people are working on a particular theory. And I think that certainly was true of string theory 10 or 20 years ago. It's perhaps somewhat less true now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I want to gently... Yeah, I want to gently... Oh, no, kidding. Can you hear me okay, Martin? Do you hear me, Martin? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Um, so in the uh, towards the conclusion of the book, you make a very provocative statement in some sense about where scientists uh, should fit in. And I want to push back provocatively as well. Uh, so you say mm -hmm. that physicists don't get better with age, they burn out. And first of all, I think there is kind of a misconception that, um, that you know, you do your best work by age 30. That may be true in mathematics. Um, and I taught this conversation with Jim Simons about this, uh, as mm -hmm. well as others. But in experimental physics, you only get better. In other words, talking to Barry Barish, he, he has brilliant ideas that will benefit the Simons Observatory. And, and we recruit people, elder statesmen and women in this. We actually have a committee of the most distinguished men and women on earth, in my opinion, some very young and some older. And in uh, and, an experiment, at least, I feel that this statement is not true, that scientists do get better with age. It's just maybe I mean, they're not as creative. I don't, I, this question, I don't think I... I don't think I denied that. I, I, I said that uh, um, what, what can go wrong is if the old ones um, don't stick to what they're good at, um, yeah. but uh, go into some new field. And uh, uh, and one think of Shockley and Fred Hoyle, yes. people like that, who, who go into a field they didn't know anything about. And the reason for that is that uh, uh, they're still um, scientifically motivated. They want to understand the world, but they don't any longer get satisfaction from continuing on a plateau doing uh, the work they're good at. Mm -hmm. uh, and benefit from their experience. They want to do something something new, and they overreach themselves. Mm -hmm. That's a danger. Yeah, but, uh, um, I, I do say that uh, if people are happy to go on on a plateau and deepen their experience, that that's that's fine. Yeah. So you but do they say they, then... they won't get better um, in their theories, and uh, uh, I do pose a contrast um, between um, uh, um, math mathematical physicists, etc., and say composers, because for most, for many composers anyway, their last works are their greatest. That's right. Whereas there aren't many scientists of whom you'd say that. And the difference is because if you're a composer, 
you're influenced by musical styles when you're young, but thereafter it can be just internal development, where science is an inherently social activity, and uh, you can't uh, uh, stay up to speed in science unless you're able to absorb new techniques and new ideas, and that's what would become uh, less adept at as we get older. So I think that's, that's a difference. But uh, if you stick with what you're good at, um, th then uh, you can at least stay on the plateau, even though you may not get to higher peaks. Yeah, I want to yeah just echo that. And it is true. You certainly said that eminent and elderly scientists get shielded. And I'll come back to that in just one second. But you made me think of this thing I've I've been thinking about with regard to, of all things, estate planning, you know, which is which is not as as um, munificent as it might sound, but just that um, many things in life are benefit from what Albert Einstein reportedly called the greatest invention of the human mind, namely compound interest. So one of those, I had a guest on Bill Perkins a few months, uh, about a month ago, and he was saying that you want to accumulate memories just like money because your memories go grow and compound you know, with, with time. So the earlier you make a memory, the more time it has to grow. And I feel like that's also true with many things, but including at least the only discipline I'm familiar with, which is experimental science, that you kind of compound, oh, I've seen that problem with this type of electrical conductor, and we need to use this because it's going to behave better at high altitudes. And you do compound, and just like compound interest, you know, the last doubling period is, is equal to everything that came before it. Uh, mm -hmm. And that might be why composers, their last work is their best because they're basically doubling in their last work everything that yes, they've yes. done up until that point. Yes, yes. Um, yes. I do want to run. That really, is that really true for many scientists? It's, I'm I mean, only thinking about experimental scientists. I think the, the the point I was trying to make is that experimental scientists benefit from wisdom and age. You look at David Wilkinson, who was doing great work up until literally the day yeah. he died. Yeah, but no, but then yeah. you look at theorists, and you look at uh, some theorists, and yes, they tend to be doing the same thing they were doing when they're 40. You know, it has to it has to have some interest rate associated with yeah, it. Yeah or it doesn't improve, yeah. right? Uh, but just like losing weight, if you want to lose weight, um, you know, 10 pounds or five kilos in a year, and you do so a 1% loss per day, you know, the first three months, you're going to lose less than, you know, a quarter of a kilo or something that you could undo by drinking one glass of soda. So, uh, so it's very slow and, and, and it sneaks up on you. And just like you talk about exponential effects in here, the climate mm -hmm. crisis, et cetera, which, which hopefully we'll get to in the remaining minutes that we have, but um, but I want to uh, just run a provocative idea by you, and that is um, that I think after a scientist gets to be a certain age, uh, that maybe their best contributions could be teaching, and that could free up the younger researchers. Uh, you know, younger than me. I'm not arguing on my behalf. I'm I'm already almost fifty, so that uh, that won't apply to me. But you talk about this this problem of. Researchers not getting their first grant until they're 40 and starting their own, you know, and by that time in years gone by, that would be towards the end of their career. So my provocative thing is that we should only have theorists teaching <laughs> uh, because they certainly know all the classes. They know how to teach, you know, quantum electrodynamics as well as I do um, and maybe better. But you know, their work is less dependent on, on getting grants and, 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 and proposing original research to go out. And I once proposed this to my colleague, Kim Greist, and he said, I'll fight you if you <laughs> like, he was going to have a fist fight with me because he's a theorist. And, and I wonder, how do you feel about this provocative idea that, that we basically have the theorists in physics? I don't know about other fields is for them to solve, but get these older people that are, that are distinguished and brilliant but they're not as, uh, it's not as critical to them to be out in the field or collecting research data as it is for a younger person than me. Well, I mean, I think uh, that's one solution, but, but I think there are inherent problems, which I address in my book, um, with academia now. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was an article recently for a British magazine, and you know, the editor makes up the title. And the title they gave me was, Why I'm Glad I'm Not a Young Academic. Because what I was saying was that um, uh, it's uh, less attractive than it used to be when, when, I, when I was starting. And uh, this is not, not the case. I mean, uh, um, uh, the, the worst situation is biomedical sciences in America. That's where there was a report uh, that you get your first grant in the NIH when you're 42 or 43. Um, and um, uh, to take an example, um, the, the uh, one of the members of that committee, um, to, to the um, ex-president of Princeton, told me that she um, 
um, to put up by my age, and she, she got a PhD in three years, then a postdoc for three more years, and then got a grant to set up her own lab. Now that's not possible because the demography is so different. Back, back in the 1970s, the number of people was going up very far, so, so the young outnumbered the old. Um, and, and there's quick promotion. And um, uh, obviously, uh, we can't have continued exponential growth. But I do think that it's going to have the consequence for academia, which is very bad. And that's that the most ambitious and flexible people won't go into academia or research. Um, there'll always be the nerdish element, people like me who will go into academia um, and, uh, uh, and pursue some obsession, etc. But academia needs to get its share of flexible, talented people who want to feel they've achieved something on their own by their 30s. And that was possible in academia um, 50 years ago. But it's much harder now, um, given that uh, um, the, the, the numbers are stagnant now. And indeed, it's aggravated by the fact that in America, you don't have a retiring age. That makes it far worse, actually, because people in their 70s are soaking up lots of the money. Um, but, but it's going to be bad. And what this is going to mean, I think, and I mentioned this in my book, is that um, there will be a st stagnation, perhaps, within academia, and perhaps there'll be a resurgence of the independent scientist. Um, because in the 19th century, you know, Darwin and Lord Rayleigh and people like that were great men, uh, but they weren't an institution. They had the resources, they did their own stuff. And of course, we know there are people now um, who make a lot of money by the time they're 40, and they've got scientific expertise. And I think there may be more of those people, and we, we know a few of them, but there will be more, um, who um, uh, do very serious science. Um, and so things will become perhaps, perhaps like the 19th century, when the best science is no longer done in universities, simply because um, it's a very hard slog in university um, to, uh, to get to a position where you have uh, independence. Universe could change to do this, and there's a role for government labs and things like that in, in some areas. But uh, I think we do have to bear in mind that uh, yeah, if you have a sort of slow promotion and uh, people have to fill in lots of forms to get grants before they could do anything, you're going to deter the people you most want to keep in. Right. And you talk a lot about in the book about the potential for a pandemic, um, you know, to to strike and the vulnerabilities that we have. Let's turn to the to the book a little bit more in detail now. I, I found it so delightful. Of course, we're talking with Lord Martin Rees, author of On the Future and many other books, uh, including uh, Our Cosmic Habitat, Just Six Numbers, Our Final Hour slash Century. Again, whichever comes first. Um, so I, I just devoured this book. I've got every page is highlighted, so it's kind of I, I lose contrast every now and then. Uh, but you you say here on uh, page seventy seven, pandemics are an ever present natural threat, and obviously uh, you know this has crippled a lot of things in the world. But and the human tragedy, we have to say that is and believe that uh, it's been it's been unbearable in some ways, um, but. Uh, does it present us with opportunities? You were just talking about opportunities for people that are technologically minded, et cetera. Um, I found, you know, that I've been able to cancel a lot of in-person meetings and and I've been having uh, to spend more time looking at data rather than, you know, tw turning screwdrivers. Uh, might that have a benefit, you know, five years down the road? Again, ignoring the awful human consequences. Do you see any bright spot, you know, COVID dividends? In science? Well, I think it will be in that sense. I think we've learned that uh, a lot of the travel we've done is unnecessary um, and uh, uh, we, we can work more efficiently, etc. So um, I think we're not going to go back to the old normal. We're going to go back to a different one. Um, but we could have learned those lessons without having a pandemic, couldn't we? We, don't need to, uh, we? we could have learned them already and we probably would. But we learn those lessons more quickly, I think, than we would have done before. And you talk about the vaccine and how, um, you know, this is, it's, it's really amazing. I want to know who, who told you about the, you know, were, were you in Wuhan a few years ago? Uh, <laughs> Lord Reese? Um, uh, but you talk about, you know, the instantaneous code for the vaccine that could be transmitted around the world. And of course, a lot of things have gotten better and tracing and so forth. One thing was kind of provocative that I uh, must say I was surprised by towards the end. You spoke uh, relatively negatively, I would say, about um, about things like blockchain and Bitcoin is basically 
you know, you, you, you said that they don't really serve a useful purpose, et cetera. Do you still believe that? Because I, I can think of some ways that we could use blockchain or, or Bitcoin, even in the context of, you know, the virus and, and safeguards, et cetera. What, have your, has your opinion changed? Or if not, why do you feel that, that blockchain is essentially uh, uh, has negative implications for, uh, for society? Well, I mean, uh, I, I don't go into detail, but but I think um, it's a symptom of what's wrong with society that so much of our effort goes into uh, making things secure. You know, if you imagine what fraction of our economy goes into uh, uh, computer security, safety, uh, air security, etc., things that we would not have to do at all if we could trust each other, mm. then yeah. uh, of course um, trust is not how much of the economy is uh, unproductive. And of course, if you think of the economy in general, then uh, quite a large fraction of the financial sector is uh, is unproductive. It's creaming off money from the rest of us mm -hmm. and uh, not producing anything. So uh, I think the way people work um, and the uh, relative importance of different industries um, is certainly far from optimal. And uh, um, I, I don't know about blockchain may have advantages, um, but of course, the d downside is that its main motive is to uh, um, uh, provide security, which you wouldn't need to bother about if you could trust people. Right. But of course, you know this from your association with uh, Cambridge and Isaac Newton, that you know Isaac Newton was master of the mint. And one of the most mm -hmm. vexing problems that he solved was the problem of coin clipping. Uh, and yeah. he, did so, he did so very ingeniously by putting ridges on coins of, of precious metal. I find it very... Yes very, uh, very um, kind of humorous almost that we still nowadays have these ridges on the edges of quarters, which used to be a quarter ounce of silver in America, and now are like zinc and tin and aluminum, you know, and they have no value whatsoever. But we still have these fluted or ridged edges that Isaac Newton uh, provided really solved that age old problem. Uh, involving trust and counterfeiting where coins would be shaved down and the scrapings would then be accumulated enough to make a full coin mm -hmm. and that would cause inflation. So much so that in the 1200s, as you know, uh, the Jews of, of England were expelled because of this concern that they were behind this uh, coin clipping scandal. And, uh, and yet this was solved by a physicist, uh, essentially, um, who had a day job, you know, coming up with calculus and gravitation, et cetera. So mm -hmm. trust issues go way back. I, I don't know that this is uh, yeah. this is going to go away. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Mm. So um, the, the other thing that I found, uh, you know, very provocative about this book is that you, you talk uh, about the opportunities and you talk about um, how we can use uh, sort of a type of risk management approach to to solve some of these vexing problems. And I guess, you know, first of all, my, my question to you is, you know, we look at something like climate change, which you speak very vociferously about in this book, and convincingly, we'll always have different approaches to complex problems. I don't think there's a single solution. But um, what is it, uh, you know, in your mind that we would do if you were Emperor Mar Lord Martin, Re you know, Lord in the, in the Darth Vader sense, uh, what would you enact uh, if you could to uh, start to address this issue? Because uh, let me just preface this by saying, I find it very um, depressing when we say, you know, with, there's no solution, we have to cut off everything now. And I remind people that back in 1800s, do you know what the worst problem is that threatened the financial industry on Wall Street in America, Lord Martin? No. It was the problem of, of horse manure that was gathering right. on Wall Street and preventing yeah. traders from going and, and peddling their yeah. stocks. Yeah. So that was solved, right? It didn't involve, you know, uh, making, putting horses on a diet or, you know, putting diapers on horses. Uh, it was solved by technology, namely the car. Yeah. And I wonder, you know, do we not hamper our children and the imagination of future generations by saying, we just have to cut out what we're doing now and, and not really think so much about maybe you know, big risky things that could have huge rewards. So, where do you come down if you could, if you could by fiat, uh, may implement changes? What what would you start with? Well, I mean, if, if we're talking about climate, then I think the answer has to lie in new technology. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I would have thought most people agree with that. Um, uh, um, politicians won't gain much resonance if they uh, promote a sort of hair shirt policy that people have to deny things. But uh, I, I think. Uh, um, with new new technology, uh, then uh, I think it is possible for us to move towards a uh, system where we can provide affordable 
uh, carbon-free energy for the world. And we ought to prioritise this. And um, I've been arguing this certainly in Britain. Um, uh, in, in, in Britain, um, we're a small country and we produce less than 2% of the world's CO2 emissions. So if we uh, achieve our declared target of zero net carbon by 2050, that only makes 2% difference to the world. Right. But I would claim that uh, um, our country has had more than 2% of the world's clever ideas <laughs> over the last few hundred years. And uh, if we um, had a huge investment in, um, in clean, clean energy and energy storage, batteries and all these things, uh, so that we could make it easier and more affordable for, say, India and Africa, to leapfrog directly to clean energy, then we make far more than 2% difference to world CO2 emissions. Because, of course, um, um, uh, the US and, and us, we can probably cut our um, energy needs by a factor of two without any great hardship. Whereas countries like India and Africa, they're going to have to expand their energy needs to have any decent standard of living. Um, and so um, not only is the population growing very fast there, but the per capita consumption is going to be higher. So the most important thing is to ensure that those countries which need to develop can do so in a carbon-free way. Mm. And that can be done if the technology is available. And so we should help them. Mm. By we, I mean the advanced countries like the US and the UK. Um, we should help them by um, investing very heavily in the development of all the things we need for clean energy, and that would include nu nuclear in this as well. Mm. Um, so I, I think that's that's the way to do it. And it's hard to think of a more inspiring goal for young engineers um, than to provide clean and affordable energy, not just for rich countries, but so that uh, um, India and Africa can develop a better standard of living. Mm -hmm. So th that, that, that's the line I take. And incidentally, um, a similar argument applies to food. Um, because uh, there'll be 9 billion people in the world by 2050, and um, they certainly can't all eat as much beef as present-day Americans. Um, <laughs> it's got to be a slightly different diet. Um, that and, reminds uh, me, I'm late uh, for a barbecue, so we should hurry. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, yeah, and, uh, uh, and so um, uh, we, we've got to have high-tech agriculture, um, it, um, sustainably intensive farming of vegetables and also artificial meat. That's a great technology and there have been advances just this, the week we're speaking. Um, the um, uh, artificial meat um, for American companies being uh, approved in Singapore officially. Right. This is the first step forward. And these technologies are important. So I'm saying that the technically advanced countries um, can develop benign technologies in order to provide carbon-free energy and enough food for 9 billion people in the world by 2050. So yeah. that's the argument I, I would give. I did do an interview with an author of a book, uh, Chase Purdy, with an uh, who wrote the book called Billion Dollar Burger about the quest to produce lab-grown meat. And uh, oh, yeah. prices have come down from a billion dollars. A dollar bit, yeah. Yeah, yeah, they're, 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 they're yeah, still yeah. quite high. I want to finish up uh, in the, the few minutes that we do have left. If you have a few more minutes, uh, Lord Martin, I very much appreciate it. Uh, I want to ask, I'm talking with Leonard Malad now, who spent a lot of time at Cambridge working with your late colleague, uh, Stephen Hawking. And uh, he talks a lot in, in his most recent book, which is kind of like a biography of, of Stephen Hawking's friendship with uh, Leonard Malad now. And uh, I wonder, you know, in terms of the partnerships that you've had with remarkable people, uh, I want to get to Lord uh, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, who passed away as well in a minute. But, but first with Stephen Hawking, the kind of, you know, collegiality is, I think, one or at least, um, you know, coming together uh, has been lost in COVID. It, it is possible to save, you know, on traveling for a colloquium, but it's not possible to have the same colloquial kind of interactions. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if that, in your mind, is going to change, you know, briskly with the advent of a vaccine, or is this going to permanently affect science in, an, in my opinion, a very negative way? The All the authors I've written about, and you as well, talk about your most, you know, kind of uh, delightful moments are with colleagues. So will that be permanently uh, uh, ratcheted down as we go forward? Well, I worry very much about this. And uh, I think it's true that, you know, uh, people like us can probably travel less when it's just for a meeting or something like that. But uh, thinking back to my own career, I benefited hugely from being able as a postdoc to um, um, 
uh, visit the main centers in the US and to get to know my contemporaries around the world and also have a chance to talk informally to senior people. Now, if you're postdoc and there's a big Zoom conference, then you may get your 10 minute slot, but you get no feedback and you get no chance to chat informally to senior people. So I think whatever we do, uh, if we're in charge of research group, we've got to make sure that the young people can travel in the way they used to. I mean, the, the old people who already have the contacts uh, can probably um, uh, do their work remotely if you know people already, but the young people need to have the real contacts. And I think uh, otherwise I would share your concerns very much indeed. Mm -hmm. And when we think about um, colleagues outside of our own academic uh, sort of silo, um, yes. you must have known uh, Rabbi Lord John Jonathan Sachs, who passed away. Can you say something about him uh, and what you know your relationship might have been like as 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 lords? <laughs> yes. Um, uh, well, uh, I didn't know him well. I mean, I've read some of his books and I heard him talk and. Uh, uh, you know, he was a very, very clear speaker. Uh, there's one thing I found, found very hard to reconcile about him, which was his sort of um, uh, general sort of ecumenical style in general, combined with his very austere, intolerant style doing his job as chief rabbi. It was a famous case when he refused to go to the funeral of a more liberal rabbi who was a national figure. It was a scandal at the time. So I couldn't understand how he combined uh, um, his general uh, views with uh, being rather sort of intolerant um, uh, in his role as chief rabbi. So that was my perplexity I had about him. Yeah, um, he of course died very suddenly, uh, just just a, about a month and a half ago. It's surprising. He was um, he was only in his uh, just over seventy, I think, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah, I think he was seventy two. Very vibrant, and he still his children and his foundation carry on his important work. One thing he was known for that I do uh, note that you are participating in as well is social media, and actually you have a Twitter account, if I'm not mistaken, which I'll link to in this. Um, I've had conversations with people. For the last six months, yes. Yes, yes, it's delightful, and I, I do. Uh, no, no Facebook, no, uh, yeah. no WhatsApp. Yeah, and I will, I will put that uh, on in the show notes for this episode, so people can follow you. And uh, but I've spoken with eminent scientist Paul Steinhardt comes to mind, where he views it as a very pernicious element. Lenny Susskind feels the same way that it almost is, um, it it almost is kind of um, de detrimental in the fact that it may stymie and stifle new ideas. Imagine you're you're coming up with this idea for CMB polarization in 1968, and you're you're giving a lecture, and and you know. Fred Hoyle's there, Jeff Burbage is there, uh, or and they're not there, but they tweet out, oh, look at this crazy idea. And, um, I mean, do you think of it as on the scientific front, obviously in, in kind of politics or whatever, we could we could take or leave it, but do you believe it has a net beneficial uh, effect for scientific progress or do you think it's detrimental? Yes, well, well I think more generally, uh, outside science, I think it's definitely detrimental. I think, to, uh, um, I think social media... Um, th th they hollow out the center and they amplify extremes, which is the reverse of what we used to have when we had uh, all the news filtered through responsible journalists. So it's bad. But in, in science, um, I think I'm ambivalent. I mean, it can do harm. But I think, um, and again, this is a aspect of what I was saying earlier about academia becoming less attractive. I mean, if people are sort of constrained that the only thing that matters is writing a paper in a learned journal, um, and they will write a few papers per year, and that's it, you know. I think that's a pity. I think it would be far better if there was far more blogging and interaction and people got credit for writing good blogs and um, uh, um, inventing new courses and things like that. Um, I think it's unhealthy that in academia the, the refereed paper is the only thing that counts. Mm -hmm. I mean, I agree that there's a risk of uh, um, lowering, lowering standards if you um, value these other things too much, you've got to uh, make clear that it's a different aspect of one's life. But I think to actually encourage people who um, uh, spread and popularize their science widely and uh, engage with these issues, um, it can be done. I mean, for instance, um, in my college in Trinity, um, uh, Tim Gowers, who's one of the world's leading mathematicians, he's had a very effective blog and um, he's done two things. Um, first, he led the campaign against Elsevier, you know, the commercial publishers ripping off academics with the cost of journals. Uh, and But also he um, got 
a theorem that was proved collectively. You know, we talked at the beginning about maths being uh, something which is done uh, in a solitary way, but uh, he had some idea of a theorem that hadn't been proved, and uh, he got this proved by contributing about 70 different people on, on, his, uh, on his blog and website. And so uh, to encourage people to do that and try and make science of social activity is good. And uh, I think the social activity of science are what are most attractive for me. I mean, uh, I've uh, enjoyed having collaborators, being in a place where ideas are buzzing, etc. It becomes a bit uh, solitary if uh, you have to work just on one narrow theme. So um, the, the interaction is very, very important. One thing that's uh, very prevalent on social media now are the presence of artificial intelligent bots. And I want to ask you about artificial intelligence, uh, but maybe a question out of left field. Your feelings on the Nobel Prize are well known, at least to me. Uh, you criticized my book, not in your blurb, thank God, but you criticized my my book. And you, you said to me something like, you wish I had focused more on the cosmology and not at all on the Nobel Prize. Uh, but I want to ask you, pertinent to artificial intelligence, um, what do you think are the chances that an artificial intelligence could either win a Nobel Prize or create something that would be perceived in physics uh, of being Nobel worthy? Um, well, I mean, uh, uh, I think we had just recently the um, protein folding success of the deep mind people and that's example. And uh, I think it's quite likely that uh, um, if string theory is the correct theory, we may only learn that through an AI having worked through the complicated 10-dimensional geometry. Uh, so you can well imagine that uh, um, the geometry could be coded in such a way that the uh, computer with the advantage of speed could explore all the options just in the way it's done with protein folding. And uh, as I said earlier on, uh, we'll only know that uh, a theory is correct if it spews out the right mass of the proton or strength of gravity, etc. cetera. Um, but it's quite conceivable to me that a theory uh, like string theory involves very, very complicated mathematics, which no human being could do in a lifetime, but which nonetheless could be solved by, the, um, b b by, by a machine. And uh, uh, so um, that doesn't mean you give them a prize, but they, um, they, they, they are, uh, would be uh, an aid without which the work would not have been done. So I think that's completely on the cards. Mm -hmm. Very good. Okay, I want to finish up with questions that I ask of all my uh, guests who come on the show. And they are um, really centered around big questions, final questions that in some sense do uh, harken back to Sir Arthur C. Clarke, the namesake yes. of the center that I co-direct. Did you know Sir Arthur? I, I forgot. No. I didn't. I exchanged emails with him actually uh -huh. um, about the jet of M87 and whether it was artificial. Um, but uh, uh, I have emails, but uh, I never actually met him. Okay. Um, but, but, uh, but, but his Profiles of the Future, of course, which is the book we're celebrating, um, was a big influence on me. Yes. Yeah. We have uh, designs to update that uh, for the future. And if so, we will include you. I am uh, uh, of that. I have no doubt. Uh, well, the, we'll get to Sir Arthur's uh, influence on the final questions after this first question, uh, which I ask of all my guests. And that involves something in Hebrew. It's called an ethical will, a zava'ah. And it, it is related in some sense to Alfred Nobel, who gave away his material goods, but he also had this kind of heterodox component that the winners benefit mankind. Uh, and that is non-material, immaterial, and sort of ethical in nature. And I want to ask you, uh, if you were to put uh, something in your ethical will, not your material will, and that will undoubtedly, uh, your material will undoubtedly contains nothing but blockchain and Bitcoin uh, <laughs> after today's conversation. Uh, but I want to know, what would you offer in terms of wisdom or values for not only your biological offspring, but your ideological offspring, of which I count myself as one? Yes. Uh, well, I think... Um, uh, Going back to my concerns expressed in the book we've been talking about, um, uh, I would say we've got to realize uh, that uh, um, the inequalities in the world need to be reduced. There's inequality within countries um, and inequalities between the wealthy northern parts of the world and uh, 
uh, and Africa and other parts. Uh, we won't have a, a peaceful world uh, unless those are diminished. And so I think uh, any money I was able to leave, etc., would go towards those those causes uh, to reducing inequalities because uh, it's an ethical indictment that the wealth of the two million richest people in the world could double the income of the bottom billion. It's not happening. I wonder, you know, because you, you do mention that and you mentioned the, you know, income inequality or in, or just wealth inequality. Yeah. Do you have a practical way to, to you know, to administer that? You know, for example, I look at there's um, Michael Atherton was a star cricket player and he's known for, uh, I don't know, how do you say it? Hitting many centuries or I, I don't follow cricket if you can't tell, but never <laughs> Very wealthy, and I just wonder how how would we do it? We have shortstops in America that make a hundred times what I make as a university professor, and they're not even that good. Uh, so how do you go about doing that? How do you distribute income? How would you do it again, as Lord of uh, Empire of, of of the planet, not just of the British Empire? Well, it's accepted as it's getting worse, and that the uh, the top point one percent has been is the only segment of the population in the US, which is better off in real terms than 20 years ago. I think this is true. So something is, in my view, going very wrong. And it's uh, almost as bad in, in my country. Um, and uh, uh, I, I think the um, the tax system could do something about this. Very good. I don't believe uh, anyone so needs such a huge incentive to keep them working. <laughs> so the next one, a uh, question I ask my guests, uh, does relate to Sir Arthur C. Clarke, and that is connected to the movie 2001, A Space Odyssey, where these uh, pr uh, primates or hominids on the plains of the savanna of Africa come upon this enormous monolith. Are you familiar with that scene? I am, yes. Yeah, so then, and then later on, it's, and they don't know what to do with it, so they hit it with a bone or, you know, something which makes me hungry for, for the barbecue that I'm missing. But, uh, but then later on, it makes an appearance on the moon and space, et cetera, and it's clear it's meant to represent some sort of a time capsule, something that humans are meant to encounter when and only when they are able to benefit from the wisdom or the knowledge or, the, or, or something contained within. And you talk a lot in this book about potential cataclysms uh, that could occur. And I want to remind you what uh, Feynman said, his so-called cataclysm question. He said, if in some cataclysm, all of scientific knowledge were to be destroyed and only one sentence passed on to the next generation of creatures, what statement would contain the most information in the fewest words? And so he gave an answer about atoms containing, you know, being the building blocks of everything. I want to ask you, what would you put on your monolith, a billion year lasting time capsule that encapsulates maybe all of science or all of your accumulated wisdom, perhaps? Yes. Um, well, I think uh, Feynman's answer is the one I would give. I mean, that, that's, that's the best. But I think to... Uh, um, uh, to, to phrase it slightly differently, if, if you ask me um, what uh, I've changed in my views about from being young to being pretty ancient now, um, it's to, to um, become more amazed at the mystery and wonder and complexity of the universe and, and the world, especially the biological world, because, um, uh, you know, most people, you, you look at an um, insect or something flying around and you, uh, you think they're, they're a common thing, but, but if you just think of when the insect flaps its wings once, all the series of chemical reactions that have to go on and how it's got to find out, then the amazing complexity in even what we think of as a very humble manifest of nature, um, I, I don't think when I was young I appreciated that. And I don't think most people do. I think if you think about animals and plants, you, you don't realise that um, if you think about them in the way that, Feynman's recommending, which is in terms of uh, uh, really uh, basically chemistry, it's amazing the intricacy that's involved. And so uh, I'm more and more um, amazed at the complexity and uh, wonder and mystery of even simple things. Yeah, me too. I, I think about that often. And when I think back to when I was younger, something sad would make me cry or make me emotional. And nowadays, it's much more likely to be something good uh, or beautiful, as you just mentioned, that, you know, especially having children, etc., that brings me to the state of emotion, because it's so rare, precarious, unlikely, 
unentropically favored that we experience goodness. And I think the pandemic has taught me that, reinforced me that uh, a notion even more so to appreciate the, the grandeur and the beauty of the world. Of course, we always have to balance that against the tendency to worship nature, the Gaia hypothesis, et cetera. Um, but I thought it was interesting. I interviewed uh, Andrurian this summer, uh, the widow of the late, great Carl Sagan, oh, yes. who endorsed your book as well. Uh, yes. She's a writer and producer of, of, and director of yes. Cosmos. And she talked about your ability to be as a prophet, essentially as a prophecy of uh, being a lost art, but no better person than you to take a multi, multi-dimensional meditation of one of our most distinguished and wise scientific minds. I, I couldn't agree with that more. And it reminded me to tell you, her, I asked her, what would you put on a billion year lasting time capsule? And she said, you mean, what did I put on a billion year lasting time capsule? Because she, oh, cool. yes, yes. Yeah, she recorded her, her brainwaves yeah, for the Voyager 1 uh, golden disc, so-called golden disc. I thought that was amazing. Okay, the last question. I had the honor of giving the, uh, the first Carl Sagan Memorial Lecture oh. at, at Cornell. We set up uh, for the Carl Sagan Center. And, uh, and she was there to chair it. This was uh, three years ago. Mm. Oh, wonderful. Yes. And her daughter has recently become an author and wrote a book for oh, small really? creatures such as we. And I had both of them on the show at different times. So it's my first mother-daughter uh, guest appearances on the Into the Impossible podcast. That's a, quite, uh, I, I, I call them the first family of the cosmos. No, no pun intended. No, they're great. In fact, I remember I first met them when they were doing the first Cosmos series in the uh, uh, about 1980, wasn't it? And, yes. Uh, and it was Cambridge there, and I was already there. Wow. Yes, I would have loved to, to have gotten to know uh, Carl. Uh, unfortunately, there aren't many of them, as you point out. Uh, he was unique almost. Maybe there's one other person. Uh, but speaking of one other thing, I want to bring up the last of the three questions, which is Sir Arthur C. Clarke had these many laws, and one of which, which we open the show with, is an actual recording of his voice saying, the only, uh, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. So that was his, some people say it's a second law. I don't really care. I call it his first law. His second law is um, for every expert, there's an equal and opposite expert, which I, I have found to be uh, true in some context. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and the last law is the only way to discover the limits of the possible is to venture a little bit beyond them into the impossible. You, and you hinted at this before, but I want to ask you just, just uh, in summary, what thing about life or science mystified you as a, as a young person, a 20-year-old Martin, before you were a Lord, um, that you would give advice to? And what would that advice be uh, to your former self to go a little bit into the impossible? What would you tell a younger version of yourself uh, in terms of life advice? Yes, mm -hmm. Well, I think what I would tell any scientist is to pick a topic where new things are happening, new ob observations, new techniques, more powerful computers, um, so you can do things the old guys never had a chance to do. Otherwise, you'd be getting stuck on the things they tried to do and failed. So you've got to go into a subject that's, that's changing fast. And uh, if I were to predict what that's going to be, um, it's going to be the, the interface of computing and uh, biology and astronomy Very and uh, and I, I would encourage them to think about um, uh, alien life what might be out there and of course one of the most exciting areas in science of course as you know is uh, exoplanet research in 10 years we probably know if there's a biosphere on some of them and uh, you might learn something even more exciting so <laughs> I would encourage people to work in a field where there's new techniques new understanding and uh, that's, uh, as Carl would be working on if he was still alive, one of the most exciting ones. Absolutely. Well, uh, Lord Martin, Reese, I want to thank you so much uh, for taking time out of your very busy schedule. Uh, you mentioned to me uh, in passing uh, that you were working on another book. Is that true? Um, yeah, yes, what I'm doing, doing two. Well, one is uh, going to be a sort of self-effacing autobiography. I'm going to sort of uh, uh, talk, talk about the big problems of science, including the ones we haven't yet solved, but try and uh, um, humanize it, not with my own story, which is very boring, but by uh, talking about some of the um, eminent scientists I've had a chance to meet. 
Oh, wonderful. You know, started with Dirac and uh, uh, going on to you know, Freeman Dyson and, and, and many, many others. So I think I can personalize it because I've been lucky to have a chance to meet and learn from a lot of those people. So I'm doing that. I was doing another um, rather boring book on the organization of science and uh, um, how we've got to make sure that science still provides a vibrant career for young people and how research should be organized and how universities should be changed and all that. So that's a sort of bureaucratic book I'm writing. Well, uh, Very slowly. I, would, I would love to help out in any way possible. You've been a huge influence on me personally as a, as a, as a man, as a, as a human being, but as a scientist as well. Uh, anything I could do to ever uh, to help you out, please do let me know. And I can't wait to read the autobiography. Just don't be like Charles Barkley, the famous uh, NBA basketball player in America who said he was taken out of context and misquoted in his autobiography. I, I hope that doesn't happen to you. Um, <laughs> Lord, Reed, thank you so much for going into the impossible. And I look forward to talking to you when your next book comes out. I hope you will discover primordial gravitational waves. <laughs> I'll do my best. I'll do my best. Thank you, Lord. Uh, Lord right, Martin. Uh, I want to encourage my guests to follow uh, Lord Martin on Twitter. He is Lord uh, Lord Martin Reese, I believe, on Twitter. Let me just look that up. Yes, Lord Martin Reese at Lord Martin Reese. He also has many, many books, as we've discussed. I want to ask you all to encourage you all, I should say, to please leave a rating and a review on iTunes of of this podcast into the impossible subscribe and share it with your friends so we can get more great guests we're going to have uh ray weiss on the podcast in the next few weeks joe dunkley who is a, a fellow member of the royal british empire or something like that she's coming on soon giant narlikar i already mentioned and then we have john preskill coming up in the new year and many many right. other great guests i'm trying well, to get uh, and i what's that Preskill's into AI now, isn't he? He is. He is. He's into AI and quantum uh, quantum entanglement, all sorts of things. He's 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 spent the money he got from the bet with Hawking very wisely, and we'll talk about that. Uh, as Roger Penrose says, you know, no matter what side of a bet you took with Stephen Hawking, you could always be sure of winning it because he changed his <laughs> mind so much. Uh, but uh, we'll have on Len Leonard Mladeno as well, who wrote the biog uh, biography of his friendship with Stephen Hawking, and many many other great guests coming up. Uh, and I want to thank once again Lord Martin Reese. Have a wonderful rest of your night and please be in touch about your next book. I can't wait to read it. Okay, and thank you, Brian, for having me on your show. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic.